Good morning, Crossbridge Church. Thank you so much for joining us for our Christmas kickoff series. It's called The Christmas Family Tree. We're so excited for you to be here. Christmas is such an exciting time and we're so excited for this series. We wanna let you know if you wanna connect with us during the holiday season, don't forget to download our app. It's called Crossbridge Miami Springs. You can look it up on the App Store and there you'll be able to find our upcoming events as well as ways to connect with us on our ministries. Church, we also wanna invite you in person we have a service at 10 a.m. in English and 11.30 in Spanish. So we can't wait to see you very soon in church. That's all for today. So now let us worship together. seen you turn away you have loved me undeserving oh I have seen your mercy follow me all my days oh it doesn't make sense how your love is so good you call me your friend and I thought I was too far gone now I know Never gonna let me go. Here we go. You are good, and you can only be good. You can't be anything else. You can't be anything
Today is our first Sunday of Advent, and we launch a new series called The Family Tree. And through Advent, we're going to trace back the line of Jesus all the way back to Eve, where she received the promise of a Messiah, all the way to Mary, who gave birth to a Savior. And in all of these stories that we're going to learn, uh, we're going to find elements of brokenness that we can all identify with, but also elements of longings and, and hope that find their fulfillment in Jesus. Well, today we're going to look at a story of God's promise to the future of the future Messiah, but it's given to a serpent. And in it, we'll learn that God's desire is to come to us and destroy all of the works of evil without destroying us. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. I'll be reading two verses today, verses 14 and 15. Here's what God's Word says. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It's interesting that the Christmas story uh, doesn't begin in a manger. It actually begins right here in a garden. In Genesis 2, we see our first parents, Adam and Eve, in perfect uh, paradise where they would feel no shame. And then immediately after they disobeyed God, they felt shame. They attempted to cover their shame, cover themselves up with fig, fig leaves here in order to hide from God. And what does God do? God seeks them in their hiding. He makes skins of clothes for them through animal, uh, uh, which is, by the way, the first sacrifice that we see here in Scripture, animal skins. And he gives the first gospel announcement in a declaration to the enemy, our enemy, in verse 15. And immediately after the first sin announcement, there's an announcement of a Savior. One is coming, God tells Satan. One is coming, born of a woman who will crush your head. You know, there's a painting by Grace uh, Remington uh, that illustrates the beauty of Christ. And in that painting, in that beautiful painting, we see Mary comforting Eve in the middle of her shame because within Mary's womb, there's one who will crush Satan's head on our behalf. In the painting, we see Mary smiling because Mary knows that redemption is here. Mary can feel redemption inside of her own body the same way Eve felt shame within hers. You see, Advent is not about how good we are. Advent is not a story about how amazing and holy we are and how well we fought off sin. Advent is not a story about, you know, how good people win over, you know, the, a skeptical, distant God. No, Advent is a story about people who would not let go of their sin, yet God came to them anyways. So in the garden, our first parent, first great-great-great-great-grandmother, a long, long time ago, listen to the serpent who said to them, there is something better than your God. 
There's something better, and it can only be found in disobeying Him. And when you do, you'll receive the things that He's withheld from you that are so much better than the things that He's actually given you. In essence, what the serpent was telling Eve is that there is something better than God. And Eve and, and Adam, they, they believed it. And this is important to understand because God looks at people. He looks at you. He looks at me who constantly choose something, who constantly choose someone else over him and says, I'm going to come and fight for you. How? I'm going to send my son for you. My son is going to visit the curse that you deserve for preferring something or somebody else over me. And, I'm, and he's going to bear that curse for you. I'm going to place it on my son for you in your place. So that as you believe in him, as you believe in my son, you'll receive, you'll receive all the blessings that he alone deserves. And that church is the beginning of the coming of Jesus into the world. This is an ancient foretelling of the Christmas story. And in this story, these first two verses that unpacks really a lot here, we see several things. First, we see salvation begins in the most unlikely way. At the end of verse 15, it says, He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. How do, how do we, how does man, mankind, men and women, how do we destroy a snake? You might imagine we would have to stomp on its head, either by our feet or some object. But how does a serpent, albeit a poisonous one, how does a serpent kill a human, a man or a woman? You can imagine that the serpent has to strike at the heel, right? And so God's not just saying that he's going to have victory over the enemy, but that he'll have victory over the enemy at the cost of his own life. You are going to strike his heel. You are going to kill him, God tells the serpent. But in the killing of him, this promised seed, he will raise many to life. See, our salvation is, is a promise of both death and a very costly victory because the only way that the consequences of Adam and Eve's actions could be reversed is for the very seed who is promised to bear the devastation, to bear the curse that Adam and Eve brought into the world and the curse that they deserve. It's amazing that Adam and Eve never hear God say, I curse you. God curses the serpent, but they never hear God curse him, but rather what they hear is that the son will bear the curse of his father on the cross in their place and in the place of all of those who trust him. Also amazing, God tells the, the serpent, Satan, exactly what he's going to do. It's kind of like, like if you were playing a football game and you would tell the opposing team all of your place, right? You would huddle up, you'd get your team to huddle up, not just your team, but the opposing team, and you would tell everybody, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're gonna, here's, what, here's what we're going to do the first play. We're going to run it up the middle. We're going to smash your defense. We're going to run it up for 50 yards. And, and then let me tell you what I'm going to do on the fifth play. And then let me tell you what I'm going to do on the tenth play, and so on, and so on. And so here's God speaking to the serpent and telling him, hey, since you sought to rob me of my glory and do eternal damage to the human beings that I created in my own image, and you sought to do it through this woman and through your wicked deception of her, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I am going to use this woman to bring the Savior of the world who's going to crush your head. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I love how God uses and, and how God loves to reverse the strategy of the evil one against us and uses the things that he will use against us for his own glory and our own everlasting good. I love how God comes to us when we struggle to believe. We struggle to believe in advance what only makes sense in reverse. Because if we're honest, it only makes sense when we connect the dots after the fact. Like, oh yeah, I could see how God did this and that and the other. But it's really hard to obey God when you don't know what that obedience is going to produce. He, he comes to us. And even when we disobey, even if it is your fault, even if it is your irresponsibility, God speaks to us with kindness and love and mercy, and He speaks to us and He engages with us, not so that He can gather information, He knows what you did even before you did it, but so that He can cultivate an environment where we will repent, a response of repentance. He comes to us this Christmas season 
And we love to sing these Christmas songs like Joy to the World, like the, the line that says in Joy to the World, He comes to make His blessings known. How far? Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found. Listen, God doesn't turn to us and say, hey, you know what? Save yourself. For choosing something over than me, go ahead and save yourself. He doesn't say that. He doesn't come to us and, and, and gives us good advice and say, hey, here's a little grace, use it or lose it. No, he comes to us. He comes to us and he says, here's the good news. Here's the good news. If the devil thought that he could bring sin into humanity by Eve's defection, well, I'm going to use Eve to bring the Savior of the world. And when he comes in the fullness of time, Paul tells us in Galatians, like me, he's not going to look at you and say, hey, I beat Satan, now it's your turn. No, he comes to us, church. He comes to us and like, and he says to us, like my heavenly father, I'm going to fight for you. So be clothed in my power so that you may withstand the attacks of the evil one when they come to you. And when you stand firm, understand that you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from my victory. You're not playing from your own playbook. That's a disaster. You're playing from my playbook, the playbook that God has given us and equipped us to be ready with an assurance that the decisive paddle with the enemy has already taken place and has already been decided right here in Genesis. Battle's been won. And so the stage is now set. Or as one Irish scholar would, would write when he says, he says this, the whole of Scripture is not packed into every Scripture, but we may allowably expect every Scripture to prepare and make room for the whole. This is what happens in Genesis 3, 15. This verse sets the stage of so many things that will transpire in human history. Not only does salvation come to us in the most unlikely of ways, but secondly, what we see here is salvation is unique in its origin. At, at, at the end of, or, or rather at the start of verse 15, he says, God will place enmity between the woman's offspring and that of the serpents. The reason that this statement is unique here the reason that this statement is so strange is because by God's very own design, the seed comes from where? The seed comes from every male member of every species. But here, we're told that the woman will produce an offspring without the help of a man. That's what's unique here. Here we get the first nugget of a greater truth that will be more fully revealed down the road in the virgin birth of Jesus. Satan didn't understand it. Adam and Eve didn't understand it, but God indicates that he is sending his own son into the world through a woman without the help of a man. Now, this is really important because now sin and death has entered the world. Our sinful nature enters the world and continues to be in the world because of what our first parents did. But the birth of Jesus is different since he came into the world without a human father he was born sinless and therefore qualified to bear and die for the sins of humanity. He was God in the flesh. Now, the, the whole point of this is this. You can try anything you want. You can try uh, whether it's religion, whether it's good works, whether it's eating clean or clean living, etc. You can try anything you want to please God, but nothing will be sufficient to deal with this sin problem that now comes into the world until you come to Jesus and until you are saved by His grace. Even if you end up doing the right thing, you may ask, but I, you know, I, I did the right thing and I'm on, you know, like for example, like being honest, like not telling a lie, you're honest, but it's only, you're being honest only out of fear and only out of pride. And the only reason that Adam and Eve lies here is out of, uh, of, out of fear or is because of fear and because of pride. So even in our own goodness, we're just nurturing fear and pride, which will eventually lead us towards what? Being dishonest, being selfish, being, uh, you know, having a nature of self-control. Whether you think you've rigged the system towards being good, it's only ever, only ever going to be superficial, only ever going to be external, only ever going to be pharisaical, actually. So if, if the origin story of our salvation is going to start with us and it begins inside of us, game over. We're already doomed. But if we, if we say, for example, you know, I want to be a self-controlled person. I really do. And I want to be a self-controlled person because even though Jesus Christ desperately didn't want to go to the cross, he did. 
He did. He did it for me. See, when I see Jesus, when I see Christ, not just as an inspiring example or someone who could just help me through the hard times or some just, you know, uh, the good guy or the hero in a Christmas story, but as someone who can save me from myself from the very beginning until the very end, from start to finish, then I could deal with all of my fears and all of my pride. How? Because when I look at Jesus as my Savior, it does two things. It, it, it gets rid of my pride. How? Because I must not be as good as I think I am if Jesus had to die for me. And secondly, it gets rid of my fear. Well, how does it do that? Well, it gets rid of my fear because uh, uh, while I was in rebellion against him, he died for me. I've got nothing to be afraid of now. Fear and pride. I'm using these two things because I believe they're the two main drivers. In fact, they're the two main drivers that caused Adam and Eve to do what they did. And I could argue that fear and pride are the main things that create all of the evil and all of the brokenness that we see in this world. Teaching us that apart from Jesus, apart from Jesus, there is sin that is clinging to everything that we do and everything that we say. Or as the prophet Isaiah puts it this way, he says, we have all become like one who is unclean. In all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Every time we come to God in prayer, every time we come to our corporate gatherings to worship God, we need to see what He's done for us. And when we do that, we turn what Jonathan Edwards calls common virtue into true and, and, and real virtue. Every time we're reminded that we are like prodigal sons and daughters returning home covered in filth and that our filth can only be covered when the Father puts His robe on us and His garment all over us, only then can our deeds, can our words truly be called good. Because our origin, our origin story here is that we'll do anything for our own self-glory even if it means good things, or as C.S. Lewis says, it's like, it's like we're making, a, a, every time we try to do a good thing, we try to fix things, we're like children making mud pies in a puddle when our Creator is giving us the entire ocean. When we do these things for the glory of God, out of a sense of, of beauty, this is an aesthetic, out of a sense of beauty for who He is, it's like looking at a, at a beautiful painting for who He is, and what he's done, only then can our deeds be truly righteous. Now I want to I, I, I respond in truth. Why? Because he's the God of truth. Now I, I, want to, I want to be a generous person because God's been so generous to me. Now I want to be a humble person because God humbled himself and came for me. That's what it means to grow as a Christian that throughout, these, throughout the years that we will, we will purify our motives through the years by reminding ourselves what we have found in Christ and by rehearsing it in story. A story that we all share. A story of our own unique redemption. Here's the last thing we see here. Salvation is ultimately about liberation. It's about freedom. When we sing these Christmas songs, phrases like born that men no more may die, or long lay the world in sin till he appear. This is language of, of empowerment. It's, it's calling us to live here on earth as it is in heaven, in a world that can get us to feel so worthless and so powerless, in a, in a world that's filled with so much ugly and brokenness and so much injustice, because from this point forward, from this point forward in Genesis, this world is cursed. In a broken world, it can be easy to look at life, so simple to look at life and identify ourselves as worthless and identify ourselves as powerless. However, in these two verses, we know that in the final, the final analysis, love is stronger than death because we see a God who comes to us in our suffering and in our pain and deals a death blow to the enemy. And so now I'm not holding on to my sin anymore. I'm holding on to the thrill of hope despite the brokenness, despite the fear, despite the doubt, because I realize how incredible this love is that's taken a hold of me. God's response to fallen humanity is not to give up on our own because on our own we are trapped. 
We are stuck. We are stuck in a cycle of hurting and being hurt, of hurting and being hurt. That's why we need grace to break into our world and place us and the very things that condemn us under the love of Jesus and the reign of Jesus, redeeming us, restoring us back to the place where we belong inside of God's family. I'll give you a couple examples, um, practical examples of, of how this, this plays out. A friend of mine was in an abusive church environment. The church leaders abused their authority to oppressively control the lives of its members. That, that didn't sit well with my friend. And so, the, the, unfortunately, it's very common in our city, in our city, city of Miami. And so uh, the inner judge of my friend said, yeah, don't trust that. Don't trust that. Don't sit under that. And that's a good thing. We all have that inner judge that kind of warns us, alarm bells, you know, go off. It's there to protect us. But the damage is done, right? And because of that, there's some things that my friend has to, to work through, mainly the ability to trust and hope in God. Why? Because now the, the inner judge that was meant to protect him has now become the oppressor that will not allow love to come in. I'll give you another example. Uh, a Christian girl a few years back told me she had an abortion. Uh, she didn't want to do it, but her mother uh, pressured her into it. Now she's, she carried a deep sense of, of grief. And every time she talk, tried to talk about it with her family, you know, her family would kind of push it aside and ignore it, say, ah, you, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. And, and she's been around Christians long enough to know that in casual conversations, the word murderer would be tossed around. And so she couldn't even trust and open up to her Christian friends and casual conversations so she had nowhere to go with her grief and unfortunately this story is so very common and typical of how we deal with guilt on the one hand we just want to brush it aside and ignore it and on the other end we want to we want to deal with the issue so harshly that we forget that there's a real person standing in front of us we need to be saved we need to be liberated not only from hurtful mindsets that keep us from from life but also from this distorted image of God who, who, like Eve, saw God as an accuser rather than a loving Father who wants to free us, free us from the bondage of sin. And so He comes to us and He meets us at the cross Himself, broken and condemned. And at the cross, God in Jesus took on our suffering and our hatefulness he that was without sin became sin for us. And at the point of loss and at the point of deep, profound suffering of being God forsaken so much that even the skies turned black and the earth trembled, the Bible tells us we see on the cross the truest picture of who God is, a God who suffers under the weight of our sin, a God who stoops down to meet broken humanity. And so let us be reminded this Christmas, of our providential uh, parentage and that in Jesus, all who are of Eve's offspring and have made sons and daughters of God for all of those who trust in Jesus, those you and I who come to have faith in Jesus and by His grace we are saved, we are raised up to walk in newness of life. Amen. Would you pray uh, with me? Heavenly Father, we, we praise and we thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your gracious mercy towards, towards us by, by procuring our salvation despite our rebellious sinfulness. We thank you that by Jesus' death on Calvary's cross, the head of the snake has been crushed and his power over all who trust in you has been rendered inoperative. Thank you that Jesus has prepared to be bruised for our iniquity by taking, to taking on the punishment upon himself that we deserve. We are forever thankful for your grace and mercy, and we glorify you for your holy name forever. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, friends, thank you for watching. Uh, go ahead and like and subscribe this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And remember, you can join me in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you for watching.